This is Karyamanikam Srinivasa Krishnan, the Indian physicist, teacher, and leader. Jawaharlal Nehru, another great Indian, once said of him, What is remarkable about Krishnan is not that he is a great scientist, but something much more. He is a perfect citizen, a whole man with an integrated personality. Join us as we trace the footsteps of K.S. Krishnan and explore the many facets of this extraordinary man. He rose to fame because of his collaboration with the Nobel laureate C.V. Raman. Many believe that he actually deserved to share the honor. He worked on a bewildering assortment of scientific areas ranging from the magnetic behavior of crystals to thermionics and solid-state physics. He was also an inspiring teacher and a key figure in the development of scientific institutions in India that are relevant even today. In this film, we journey through Krishnan's life, mapping his inspirations, his triumphs and failures, his genesis and his evolution. In an attempt to get a glimpse into the man, who still stands tall in the world of science. Karyamanikam Srinivasa Krishnan was born in 1898 in a small town called Watrap in Tamil Nadu. His early education was at the school in his village. Even at this stage, his mind was receptive to the wonders of science. He recalls the excitement he felt as a 13-year-old boy listening to his science teacher. Even though my teacher was not a professional scientist, he was good at explaining science in a clear and captivating fashion. Once Krishnan had to write an essay on Archimedes' principle. Even at this age, Krishnan was not content just reproducing what he knew. He experimented and devised an instrument to measure density, which he then wrote about. Later, he realized that he had unknowingly described an actual instrument called the Nicholas Hydrometer. This perhaps was the start of a lifelong career devoted to independent thought and research. In 1914, Krishnan left for Madurai, where he studied at the American College. He proceeded to Chennai, then known as Madras, where he joined the Madras Christian College. He studied science here from 1916 to 1918. Quite early on, his unique abilities at science were spotted. By 1918, Krishnan had completed his basic degree. He was almost immediately offered a position as demonstrator in the chemistry department. Krishnan's flair for teaching was evident here. He used to hold lunch hour sessions for his students, which was broadly an open house where anything scientific could be discussed in an informal, freewheeling fashion. Many students claim that they learnt more in these sessions than in their formal classes. Students from other colleges also used to come to MCC especially for these sessions. 
In spite of the satisfaction Krishnan got from teaching, it was not enough. He was desperate to be doing pure research. He needed to figure out where he would go next. At that point, there was a fair amount of buzz surrounding the work of a young scientist called C.V. Raman, who was doing exciting research in the University College of Calcutta. Krishnan decided to apply for the MSc program there. Meanwhile, there was an opening in the Solar Observatory in Kodaikanal, and Krishnan was recommended for that post. Soon enough, Krishnan received a letter announcing that he had been accepted for the MSc program in Calcutta. He decided to go there. This turn of circumstance was enough to change the face of Indian science. And so in 1920, the young Krishnan arrived in Calcutta. He writes about this most exciting chapter in his life. in physics and went to Professor C.B. Raman in Calcutta. But he did not agree for my starting research immediately. Only after learning various aspects of physics properly at the Calcutta University for two years was I able to join his research group. It was 1923 before Krishnan finally joined Raman's team at the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Sciences. He had a grueling schedule. He would complete an early morning walk by 6 a.m., which is when he reported in for work. A little background here on the work being done by C.V. Raman's team. It all started with the blue sea. Raman wondered what made it blue and started studying the scattering of light. Sunlight is white light. When this light hits atmospheric particles, Blue scatters the most, which is why the sky appears blue. What of the water? Well, first people thought it was blue because of reflection. But then, why were wells and ponds not blue? There had to be some other explanation. In search of this answer, Raman set up experiments from 1920, where he studied the results of passing light through different materials. By 1922, he had already published some of his findings. In 1923, K.R. Ramanathan, another of Raman's students, was working on an experiment on the scattering of light by water. He noticed something unusual. When sunlight filtered through a violet glass passed through the liquid, the scattered rays emerging contained certain rays not present in the incident beam. So if the incident light has a wavelength of, say, lambda 1, the emerging rays will have some light rays with a wavelength of lambda 2. Ramanathan termed this phenomenon as weak fluorescence. This is when K.S. Krishnan's contribution started. From 1925, for three whole years, he studied this phenomenon. He did experiments to observe the scattering of light in 65 different carefully purified liquids. Most of the early work in Calcutta was done by the visual observation of color rather than photography. This analysis of light was made further complicated because any impurity in the liquid could scatter the incident light and produce light in a new color. Through his work, Krishnan realized that the new radiation was partially polarized unlike ordinary fluorescence, which is unpolarized. Raman and his team needed to come up with a theory to explain this. On February 27, 1928, Krishnan observed a definite faint greenish glow in pure glycerine and reported it. Raman set out to study this on the morning of February 28. Here is a way of understanding what Raman did. The violet light of the solar spectrum is isolated with a violet filter and passed through the liquid sample. Most of the light emerging from the liquid sample is the same color as the incident violet beam. 
However, they were able to show that some of the scattered light was a different color, which they could isolate by using a green filter placed between the observer and the sample. What helped them come to this understanding was the recent discovery of the Compton effect. Simply put, this said, when a high-energy photon hits a target, it releases the outer loosely bound electrons. The scattered radiation experiences a wavelength shift. Raman realized that what he was observing was the optical analog of the same effect. By the next day, February 29th, that year was a leap year, the announcement was out in the Associated Press about this path-breaking discovery. By March 8th, Raman had sent a note to Nature announcing his discovery along with a complete explanation. The discovery came to be known as the Raman Effect. It won C.V. Raman, India's first Nobel Prize for Physics. For Krishnan and his entire group the next few days, weeks and months were periods of intense activity as they studied the various aspects of this new phenomenon. To understand the level of Krishnan's contribution, nine out of the 12 papers that came out at that time were co-authored by him. The Raman effect has huge applications even today. These are Raman spectra. They work like patterns and each substance has a unique pattern. So using the different patterns, we can actually identify different substances. This has huge applications. It can be used to affect in medicine to aid diagnosis. It can be used in forensics to detect explosives, pollutants or narcotics. There has always been some controversy surrounding Raman winning the Nobel Prize. This is because some believed that it should have been shared by Krishnan. Raman refers to this himself in a letter of recommendation to the Vice-Chancellor of the Andhra University. If the Nobel Award for Physics made in 1930 had been for the work done in the year 1928 alone, Instead of the entire work on the scattering of light done at Calcutta from 1921 onwards, Krishnan could justly have come in for the share of the prize. Krishnan himself always believed that Raman was fair to him. Arnold Sommerfeld visited Calcutta in 1928 during Krishnan's stay there. Sommerfeld was a German physicist who had pioneered work in atomic and quantum physics. His work was so outstanding that he had been nominated a record 81 times for the Nobel Prize. Krishnan attended the lectures he gave on modern developments in wave mechanics. After listening to the lectures, Krishnan helped Sommerfeld put together a book for publication by Calcutta University. He added original ideas and supplied new and elegant mathematical proofs to the work. Sommerfeld was so impressed that he wanted to publish the book under joint authorship. With his characteristic humility, Krishnan refused. A little bit now about the kind of man Krishnan was. He was deeply rooted in his culture. He loved Carnatic music and had a deep knowledge of Tamil and Sanskrit literature. He was a strong champion of science writing in the vernacular. He did a lot of science writing in Tamil. His love for literature was huge. The authors he read ranged from Plato to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He was also a great sports enthusiast and played tennis and football Every day he would finish his work and rush down to the Maidan in Calcutta to watch the football matches played out there. He would cheer so loudly and enthusiastically that the other bystanders were amused and annoyed in turn.
His sense of humor and verve for life is evident in his encounter with some Russians during a science conference. There was a lot of vodka being drunk and one of the Russians told Krishnan that vodka should be drunk in one gulp and not sipped. Krishnan, who is a teetotaler, announced that he would teach them how to drink the Madras way and downed a glass without his mouth touching the rim. Thankfully, he was not adversely affected by the alcohol. The next step in Krishnan's scientific journey was the move to the Department of Physics in Dhaka University, then headed by S.N. Bose, another stellar Indian scientist. Even though he was still bathed in the glory of the recent Nobel, Krishnan was not content to rest on his laurels. Instead, he shifted his focus to completely different areas of research. The magnetic properties of crystals in relation to their structure. His research work focused on measuring the magnetic anisotropy of different crystals. Let us figure out what magnetic anisotropy is before we proceed further. Take an object. Place it in a magnetic field. If the material is magnetically isotropic, it will not move. However, if the substance is magnetically anisotropic, it will move and align with its axis along one of the magnetic fields. So magnetic anisotropy is basically the directional dependence of the material's magnetic properties. Today with state-of-the-art machinery, this kind of measurement may seem easy. But Krishnan in the 1920s needed to use every ounce of innovation to come up with a technique. And he did. He called it the critical torque method. It is useful to have a little background in the work of Michael Faraday before we go on to Krishnan's experiment. In the 1800s, Faraday had discovered that when you create a movement in a magnetic field, you could produce an electric current. He also showed that the faster the movement, the greater the current. The slower the movement, the lower the current. Now Krishnan used this knowledge creatively and simply. What did he do? To find the anisotropy, he hung a crystal at the end of a calibrated quartz fibre. When the magnetic field is switched on, the crystal will turn if the material is magnetically anisotropic. By measuring the angle of the turn, he was able to calculate the magnetic anisotropy of the substance. This was a creative idea. Linear measurements in this scale are very complex because the movement is quite tiny. However, circular movements are easier to see and measure. Scholars like Schoenberg in Cambridge were so inspired by his method that they started using the same methodology in their research work. Today, the knowledge gained from this research finds use in vital areas like petroleum prospecting. In 1933, Krishnan came back to Calcutta to take up the post of Mahendra Lal Sarkar, Professor of Physics in the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science. Through his years here, he continued to study the magnetic properties of crystals in relation to their structure. For this work and for his work on the Raman effect, Krishnan won huge international recognition. In 1937, he was invited by Lord Rutherford to the Cavendish Laboratory, Cambridge and by Sir William Lawrence Bragg to the Royal Institution, London, to give lectures. In 1940, at the relatively young age of 42, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of London.
The year was 1942. The World War was on. By 1941, the war in Japan had started and Calcutta was thrown into turmoil. There seemed to be a danger of academic institutions being affected, even shut down. Faced with a situation like this, Krishnan accepted an offer of a professorship in Allahabad University. An interesting piece of trivia is that this department was set up by Meghnad Saha, another stalwart of Indian science. The Allahabad years proved that Krishnan was not just a great scientist, but also a wonderful teacher. Krishnan always told his students, physics means facing facts. A whole generation of scientists got inspiration from studying with Krishnan. Through this stage, maybe because of his administrative responsibilities, Krishnan was not able to do much experimental physics. But the greatness of this man lay in the fact that he was equally good as a theoretician. He started studying the physics of solids, in particular, metals. What is solid-state physics? Very simply, it studies how the macro properties of solids result from their atomic scale properties. This topic was hugely significant because it has direct application in transistors and semiconductors, which are used to power a huge number of modern-day devices, varying from computers and pacemakers to amplifiers and power transmitters. He also started work on analyzing the electric conductivity of metals and alloys with a young colleague. The study was extended to binary alloys also. Let's see how that works. Take copper, add in a little zinc. This makes the alloy brass. The addition of zinc will alter the resistivity of copper. Hence, he made a correlation between the resistivity and the composition of these materials. This knowledge is hugely useful in selecting the right material for wires. It is quite rare to find an experimental physicist with such a great grasp of mathematics and theory. The year was 1947. An independent India was headed by Jawaharlal Nehru, a man deeply committed to the idea of science leading progress. Krishnan, with his versatility, was a natural choice to head significant scientific institutions. So, in 1947, after Nehru inaugurated NPL or the National Physical Laboratory, Krishnan moved to Delhi to take up the post as the first director of the laboratory. It was a blow to give up teaching, but Krishnan was a great believer in the role of science, both for nation building and as a tool for international cooperation. Even before he took over as director, Krishnan was actively associated with the formation of the laboratory as a member of the planning committee. Krishnan immersed himself in every aspect of the job. From the construction of the buildings to establishing scientific infrastructure and building the necessary scientific manpower. Soon after he took on his post, there is an interesting story that has now formed a part of the Krishnan mystique. NPL was being constructed. One of the contractors was in the process of cutting down two trees near the entrance. Krishnan, who was driving past, was horrified and confronted the architect. 
He asked him, Why are you cutting down these trees? The architect replied, Sir, we thought they looked asymmetrical in the landscape. Krishnan said, You can still create symmetry, not by cutting down a tree, but by adding one more. It was part of NPL's mandate to develop standards for precise measurement and calibration that matched international benchmarks. So Krishnan set up the National Standard of Measurement with the Indian equivalent of various measurement units like the 1 kg standard for weight, the 1 meter measurement for length, the 1 second time unit, the 1 ampere measurement for electricity using the standards for voltage and resistance, the 1 Kelvin standard for temperature and 1 candela, the unit for luminous intensity. These standards of measurements are still meticulously maintained by NPL. A key collaboration initiated by Krishnan was with Dr. David Schoenberg, the British scientist famous for his work on low temperatures. They together set up a liquid helium plant to study the behavior of solids at very low temperatures. Why is this significant? Well, when the temperature of a body changes, so does its state of energy, as well as many of its properties. So a lot of scientific knowledge can be gained by studying bodies at low temperatures. In fact, many cataclysmic areas of physics like the development of superconductors and superfluids have been powered by research in this field. The low temperature plant at NPL is still operational and producing new research. Krishnan constantly devised ways of making the laboratory relevant. During the early 1950s, he worked at developing research and development that would help the growth of industry in India. Some of the initial R&D efforts were focused on carbon and carbon products. Carbon has enormous applications ranging from a torch battery to a spacecraft. Much of this know-how was passed on to the industry. One of his associates in NPL remembers this interesting story about him. One day, Krishnan was waiting at the entrance of NPL. A young foreign-trained scientist came up to him and asked if he could tour the laboratory. He had no idea that this was Krishnan, the head of the laboratory. Krishnan, without a word, took him around and showed him all the work the laboratory was doing. The young man was clearly showing off a bit. Finally, on completion of their tour, Krishnan passed the room marked Director. Straight-faced, he announced, this is my room. Needless to say, the young man was left speechless. From his appointment in 1947, Krishnan headed the institute for 14 years. The prominence NPL has attained nationally and internationally in areas like measurement standards, applied research, and low temperature physics can be attributed largely to Krishnan's dynamic leadership. He set up a culture and a work ethic of excellence that propels the institute even today. As his stature grew, more honors were heaped upon him. The list looks endless, but here are some significant ones. He was knighted in 1946. In 1948, he became the General President of the Indian Science Congress. The title of Padmam Bhushan was also awarded to him by the Government of India in 1954. In 1955, the US National Academy of Science invited Krishnan to be the guest speaker at their annual dinner.
He was specially flown over to America for the same purpose. It was a rare privilege which very few international scientists had enjoyed before. He held the audience of eminent US scientists spellbound. Through the late 40s and 50s, Krishnan spent considerable time in working with the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, University Grants Commission, Department of Atomic Energy and several other government agencies. He was clearly one of the key players in setting up international quality science institutions across our country. The year was 1961. That year, Krishnan was the first recipient of the Bhatnagar Memorial Award. He was soon heading off on his first ever long holiday to see a son in the UK and a grandchild he had never met in the US. That night, the 14th of June, he had a massive heart attack and died. He left behind a wife, two sons, four daughters, innumerable students and colleagues and an entire nation to bemoan his loss. His life and work still provide inspiration to new generations of Indians and scientists alike.